Hello everyone and thank you for joining us today. My name is Andrea DeMarco and I'm the Associate Director of Alumni Relations at Teachers College. Today I'm excited to present our first Alumni Career Development Webinar this academic year featuring alumna Julian Ryan. This series is co-sponsored by TC Next and Alumni Relations. This covers a range of career-related topics and features speakers from a variety of industries. Videos of past webinars are available on our website at www.tc.edu slash alumni slash career webinars. We are thankful to our alumni hosts who have shared their time and expertise to help us create meaningful and engaging programming for the TC community. Today, Julian presents, What Did You Say? Navigating the Perils of Being Digitally Distracted. Julian Ryan is the principal at J. Ryan Partners, Be Engaged at Work. She received her undergraduate degrees in psychology and urban studies at Manhattan College and is a proud graduate of Teachers College, where she received her master's in organizational psychology and leadership. Julian is a communications catalyst. As a humorous applied storyteller, coach, and trainer, she engages her audiences and clients in creative ways that promote energizing interactions and productive conversations. She is also the author of Learned It in Queens Communications Playbook, Winning Against Digital Distraction, a book that offers some humorous, straightforward answers on how to communicate more effectively in our digital age. We will be having a few discussion questions, so please submit your answers in the chat box. If you have any audio or technical issues, please chat me directly in the chat box. And without further ado, here's Julian. Well, hello, everyone, and thank you, Andrea, for kicking off the set here. Um, thanks to everyone who has joined us today. And I know how challenging it can be to set time aside for yourself and to commit to a schedule of professional development as everything keeps changing in our 24-7 virtual world. So thank you. I decided to use my big angry red dude guy. I knew it would set the tone for the session and a little bit of what my style is like. Our mission today is to find ways to avoid acting like this guy. This session is designed to help us increase our self-awareness regarding how we're using our digital devices and how we show up in our Zoom rooms from our virtual bunkers. And I'm also writing this with the hopes that one day we're going to get to use this information again in person when we get released back into our offices, lecture halls, and conference rooms. In my applied story work, I coach people to examine and use their backstory and their personal stories to find out the whys of their communication so they can work more effectively. So I'm gonna start off by sharing a few things that have influenced my work and how I think about people and their interactions. First of all, if you haven't figured this out, I grew up in Queens and I'm a lifetime New Yorker. So I lived and worked with diverse groups of people from all over the world. It also meant I had a lot of time spent commuting, which gave me time to observe people. Then there were those decades in human resources in a variety of areas, learning other people's stories and witnessing their successes, their challenges, and why it matter. Now, I can't talk about communications without mentioning teachers, colleges, and the great people I met there with the faculty. And one other factor that I always work into my session one way or the other is I've learned about communications from being married for decades from an Irish Dubliner who never made a sentence he couldn't make longer. So I refer to that as my longitudinal study in communicating. I've said, we're going to move on. Because I was presenting today in an educational setting, I felt compelled to include this statement. We've learned many important theories during our studies at teachers' colleges and hopefully have integrated them into our work and life. However, today's workshop is not about citing research studies. It's about sharing an experience that will incite reflection and some practical how-tos. So as a result, 
we're going to be operating in an ibid free environment not only that this presentation is going to be bullet point free i'm going to talk to you like we're having a cup of coffee and hanging out on a front stoop in queens new york you see I think my audience is compared, uh, composed of very smart people who are trying their best when they're communicating. But every so often, we need new ways to interrupt our brains and more importantly, our mouths, so we can give ourselves a chance to be more aware of what we're doing and make a few adjustments. So moving on, what's on our agenda for today? During our first part, we're going to take a look at our digital communication behaviors and what's going on in our brain. We're going to address how it impacts our expectations. And then I'm going to share some simple things we can do to help ourselves because it's us who's showing up no matter what kind of tool we are using. Then we're going to walk over to our world on Zoom and I'm going to share some guiding points about creative, productive, and positive Zoom experiences. We'll be sharing a few resources. And then like we said from Andrea, when she kicked this off, we're going to be having some time for comments and chats at the end. Now I'm going to pivot and make my first big point about managing our digital distractions as I address multitasking while webinaring. Okay. I know what's going on there right now on your side of the video screen and auto feed. Don't think I don't. Despite the comprehensive scientific research that true multitasking does not exist, you are convinced that you are the one person who can pull it off. You truly believe that you can listen to me and do something else at the same time. But forget about it. It's not happening. But I appreciate your situation. You've got a lot on your plate. You're trying to get you know, all done. And so for so many of you, your work from home spaces now resemble a miniature cityscape with schools, food services, and events going on simultaneously, all using the same router. So do what you can to stay tuned in to me because we've got a lot to cover. And we're gonna move through this material like we are New York City cab drivers trying to get to JFK. So hang on. But before I move on in the chat, do put a hands up symbol or a comment if you're owning up to saying, yes, I am guilty of multitasking while webinaring. It's okay, I totally get it. So what's happening with our communications? I firmly believe that humans have mutated. We have turned ourselves into a head down species. No matter what, if we are in a subway, standing in a hallway or sitting on a couch, this is our common posture. We're operating as mini digital islands tuned into a small screen, but tuned out to activity or subtle changes around us. And I'm not just people watching when I'm collecting this information. I've been talking to clients, friends, even strangers under the guise of research. So what are people saying about how they're interacting and experiencing others? No response, no response. It's like my message went into a black hole. That person is gone, gone, gone. Why can't they just call me? I can't keep up. I built a relationship with that person or company and they don't exist anymore. Please call me. Now, have I heard somebody saying, oh my goodness, please give me more of this frustration or even more. Please sign me up for more Zoom meetings. Nope. So what's happening inside our brains? I believe when we're sending our messages out, we're making an assumption that our messages are actually getting to the part of the brain we want and need, the listening part, the reading stuff part, the remembering part. But assumptions can act like that kid we knew from grade school who was always trying to get those other kids in trouble. You know, the one, hey, 
why don't we go try to climb the flagpole in front of the school? You go first. Yeah, that's the kid I'm talking about. What could possibly go wrong with our assumptions? And another thing's going on. Look at this guy. If you've silenced all your phones and alerts right now, that is great. You're listening and you're focused. But unfortunately, while you're listening to this presentation, your messages and texts haven't stopped filling your inboxes. I think of her messages like the gargoyles in those Ghostbusters movies or this cheaper and royalty free version here. They're coming to life and they're heading towards us in unrelenting pursuit 24-7. They create stress and a constant state of, I'm trying to catch up or keep up even. So in addition, while you're sitting here listening to me, you're probably frustrating somebody else who can't reach you. Now, if that person knows you and has you in some context, oh, she or he are probably on another Zoom meeting call. That might help. They might restrain from pinging you for at least another 15 minutes. But let me ask you this. What happens if that person doesn't know you? Is from a different age group, different culture, or has different expectations about what good communications looks like? What kind of dynamic are we creating without even realizing it? So it kind of will set the tone for our communications when we do get on the phone or do get in person or on Zoom. So take a step back and think about that. There might be one person that pops into your head. You might want to jot that name down in a pad next to you. So our thoughts are not reality. Two slides ago, I mentioned those trouble makers called assumptions but sometimes they like to team up with even tougher characters called transference. And those guys spend their time reminding of us of all our prior experiences with people, both positive and negative. And they're trying to help us write our internal dialogues about the people in our current situation, whether we realize it or not. So when you find yourself reacting to an email or a conversation, Take a pause, step away from the send button, step away from the keypad and the screen and ask yourself, who's directing this script? Am I dealing with fact or am I creating this story? And offline everybody, this is my go-to slide every day. Yeah, and this is a slide I never like putting up because sometimes it's us, we get it wrong. And it's so hard to share this because we're supposed to be the ones who are supposed to know better and guide others. But things happen. For example, we may send a well-crafted email to a group with lots of forward actions. And then we find ourselves getting a bit peeved because no one's responded. And we know that email was practically a work of art. So we send a follow-up message or an email and we're getting a little huffy, only to find out our message never reached its destination. That email was stuck in draft and it's been sitting there like a pigeon on a New York cable wire waiting for the opportune to fly away. So what do you do? You man and women up privately or in a group whatever the context of how you reacted to that non-communication. Simple, but it works. And what else will help? In my book, I talk about small things that make a big difference. Focused listening is the best gift you can give somebody. When I'm doing story work with clients, I ask what it was like for someone to give them their undivided attention. And the answer is always, I felt heard. I felt acknowledged. I felt that my voice was important. 
we don't spend enough time truly listening. And when I think about the situations in HR when I coached people through conflict, it was always about the failure to listen and take the time to understand. So invest the time to save time. It's the power of small things to make a difference. And I wanna share two other things that help. There is a fantastic book out there called The Power of Story, Powered by Storytelling, excuse me, by Murray Nozzle. And in he talks about the importance of preparing for listening and being aware what you're hearing in your environment, in your head before you start a dialogue with somebody. And he also talks about setting an intention for your conversation and sharing it with the other individual. Now, here in our Zoom worlds, we're working out of our homes for the most part, and there's a lot of distractions. We're half listening for the doorbell, for elder care, for child care, et cetera. So we can't always control our environment. But without oversharing, it is helpful if you set that person up who you're talking to for what your mood is or how you entered the screen, just to get them aware. Look, I know I look distracted. I'm waiting for that bell to ring. I may need to interrupt. So I'm saying it's just giving them a heads up so they can feel that, oh, it's not me. It's the situation. Simple, common sense things, but sometimes we all need to remember to do that. We're not working in elaborate workspaces with staff running to help us. We have, it's on our shoulders. So do what you can. So let's talk about Zoom world. Okay, so in the chat, please share approximately how many Zoom meetings you're having in a week. And while you're doing that, I wanna do a shout out to teachers who may not be on the call at this point in time for all the changes they have had to make in their technology, in their ways of communicating with their students. I know personally my husband teaches and I've witnessed everything firsthand from the get-go. So a big shout out for that experience and didactic learning. So we'll put that into the box and we'll talk about that later. So let's think about a few things that will help our experience on Zoom. So while we've been doing our bunkering in for the last seven months, I've been doing a listening and learning journey with colleagues and clients and friends to ask them one question. What's working? What's helping you on their meetings? What's, what are you doing less of and what are you doing more of? So here are a few things I've collected over this period of time. How we show up matters. Most of us are not wearing suits, but dressing up and making an effort for your team really helps. So get your Zoom look organized. Now, I'm not saying run a fashion show, but I do hear, like I said, from executives and colleagues, and it does make a difference with the staff or with their team. It changes and brings the energy to your voice because you sit and act differently. I worked in retail years ago and I had a situation where I had to wear clothes that were reminiscent of another period in time. And I'm telling you, I never felt strong going into a meeting and talking about HR law and regulations. So how we show up matters. Um, so the full look, even if it's off screen and you can't tell. Um, I know after six months, you may be experiencing a bit of Zoom fatigue, but it does send a message to your team that they count. One important tip, lighting changes at this time of year and situations. So I would Zoom do a tech check for your outfits and make sure that your clothes and everything are moving with you and there's no issues. So you don't experience any wardrobe malfunctions. So use tech checks for Zoom, check your lighting, check the position of your camera, et cetera, and that will do you a world of good. And your energy makes a difference. That's the next point on this presentation. Um, 
if you want to change the energy of your group, it really ends up being us that has to make the difference. Whether we're a contributor, a leader, or a staff person, it does help. Eye contact matters. So I'm gonna share a tip that I learned. When we're doing presentations that we have to sustain um, a conversation with the screen, our natural inclination in Zoom is to look towards movement or to the faces of the people we're speaking to. But the best thing to do is to elevate your camera or your iPad up so it's on eye level and talk directly to the camera screen. On certain occasions, I put a little happy face to train my eye and it feels so counterintuitive, like I said, but it does make the difference. When you see yourself um, afterwards, or if you happen to be recording that call, you'll see that you are having um, a contact. So put your energy into your voice, your body language and your hands, and it'll make a big difference. The other thing is a lot of people are talking about the Zoom meetings have been scheduled sometimes back to back. Advocate for yourself and the group that you have some breaks so you can do some energy shifting, getting out of your chair, moving around, clearing your head, sticking out your head out the window to get some fresh air for five minutes. So be that person who makes those suggestions and it will help your presentation. Even standing during your Zoom, if you can accomplish the same thing, will change the energy and also be a big help to your, your body. At this point, I wanna share a slide um, that refers back to a conversation I had with Robert Dickman. He's an author and organizational storyteller. I met him when I said, and query out to him on LinkedIn, asking him if he uh, did coaching and storytelling on performance in the New York area. And this terrific person not only reached out to me, but we ended up having a live video conversation and coached me on a performance I was giving at the time. But he left me with two important questions that I've always played forward. How do you want to receive your audience? And how do you want your audience to receive you? Because our conversations and our Zoom interactions are like mini performances. So figuring out what you want to come across like and the impact of your words. So keep that as a cue the next time you're preparing a presentation or getting ready for a conversation. What's my intention? What's getting in the way of my listening? And how do I want to interface with my audience? All righty. So you want to create a sane and comfortable environment for yourself. So one thing I advise is creating a space that is where you do your filming consistently, that you know it's not going to be a mad scramble every time you do um, a session and have to adjust lighting, et cetera. We do make changes but it should be kept to a minimal, that it doesn't disrupt it. Now, you also wanna be able to step away from that screen, like I said, and really consciously give yourself time to regroup and reflect. So create a sane environment for yourself. Now, we have our, my co-coaching friend here, the dog, who's great when they show up on videos, and it's wonderful when the cat shows up, and I know we can't always control our pets, but Figure out what we can do to keep our Zoom participants experience in mind. We don't always know what's going on behind the scenes, but we wanna make sure that we're making those people the first choice. Um, so some of you might be thinking, clearly she doesn't have a cat because she you know they always just show up when they want to. So think about what the experience, seeing those pets and those animals it can be the great reward at the end of the meeting. All right, give everyone an opportunity to be heard. Now, Zoom is step and shoulders above those audio calls of years by where you couldn't see any cues of body and language and we're always figuring out how we're gonna step up to be heard. But there's still some challenges 
first of all, it's easy in Zoom, when, especially when it's a larger group to talk over everybody because we don't, we get ready to speak and we don't see that three screens away in another square that somebody else was trying to do that too. So my guidance is just like you have a note taker or a timekeeper in a meeting, consider having somebody work with you on the, the Zoom calls to be your flagger when they see, okay, Mary was raising her hand there or she was starting to say something. It will help get the conversation flowing and also making sure that everybody is being heard. And bear in mind, everyone has different communication styles, as you know, and particularly a shout out for the introverts. I talk to a lot of introverts who are my clients and they say it's the most challenging thing sometimes, these group calls. But the power that introverts give to the situation is they're listening, they're integrating, they're synthesizing information. And when they get an opportunity to talk, they're using bring up a point that's a real game changer. So figure out what you need to do to make sure that everybody's being heard and you are capturing their thoughts and being able to give some feedback about that. Love those guys. All right. When I found this picture, I thought this totally captures the look of folks that have had way too many meetings and way too many ear um, I'm going to say emails. We are not meerkats. Let's try not to turn our colleagues into meerkats. So limit the number of messages and emails and meetings you produce. Some colleagues, as they were talking about their meetings, said they miss those moments in the office where they walk down the hallway, tap somebody on the shoulder, gave a few comments and feedback about something they'd like them to address, and it didn't require a meeting notice and 30 minutes. So think about how you're planning your information that you make the most of the time you're together. And then likewise, not everything has to be on Zoom. Pick up the phone, have a five minute conversation, and then you're done. So think about that as you're looking at your week and the coming projects you have on your list. So that's my visual prompt for Zoom. So like in Scrabble, you can get a lot of points with just a few letters. Think about that as you're planning your meet. Do we need Zoom in this experience or can we work around it and use the Zoom for when it's important or do a shorter Zoom meeting? And then as I wrap up, um, rituals make a difference. One colleague was sharing how at the end of some very serious meetings, she always makes sure during the update, she leaves time for a corny kid's joke or riddle. It loosens the atmosphere, people laugh, they smile, and they actually start to look forward to it and see if they could supply her with a few extra ideas. So whatever the ritual is, we'll bring coffee or tea, you show something you've worked on, it's a way of acknowledging and saying that your staff or your colleagues really make a difference and you're finding ways to connect. And lastly, setting expectations and boundaries. We, okay, this is one question I can ask for you. How many of you are morning people? like really morning people? And how many of you are late nighters burning the midnight oil? Okay, I see a one or two hands raised there and making comments, okay. I used to be a late night person and then over time it shifted and now I'm very, very early in the morning. But not everybody's excited to hear my, te hear my text pinging or my comments and I have woken up a few people on occasion. So I think letting people know what your expectations are and the boundaries, and especially as schedules change constantly in our home offices and homes. So that's my guidance on that for the moment. Ah, yes, I was one of those people. So let's wrap up with some thoughts so we can move on to some questions and comments and I get to meet you live and in person. 
assume the good. When we're looking at messages and comments and reactions, it's so easy to feel a little bit like that big angry red guy. To remind ourselves that thoughts are not reality. Sometimes our communications are stuck out there sometimes. So listen to our gut and determine if it's time for a phone call or a message because sometimes we've gotten it wrong. Find your front stoop. Find those moments where you can connect and really have a conversation that builds trust and understanding because those are gonna serve you well when tough situations present themselves. Going forward, how do you receive your audience? How do you want them to receive you? Your energy makes a difference and how you show up matters. So create an environment that works for you on screen. Keep those rituals because they're important and lessons more. And that's kind of an interesting guidance coming from a woman whose book title is about 82 characters long, but less is more most of the time. Ensure that others are heard and set boundaries and expectations for your group. So there's some rhyme and reason to your ever-changing world. So as promised, here's a couple of things I promise to share with you. Powered by Story, not only it's a great book, there's a connection to Columbia University because one of his founding colleagues is tied to the medical narrative program and was one of the, at the forefront of it. Another colleague and friend of mine, a manager's guide to virtual teams. And this is a font of great information and coaching about handle, handle your virtual teams and all the dynamics. Oh, and I wouldn't be a true New Yorker if I didn't plug my own. It's coming out on Amazon this week, both the hardcover and the e-version. And it's all true. And I did learn it in Queens and played it forward. And this is where you can reach me. So Andrea, I do believe you are going to be feeding me questions and comments. Yeah, thank you so much, Julianne. Um, so if you haven't already done so, uh, please submit your questions and the Q&A pane on the bottom of your screen. Uh, we did receive one question already, so thank you so much for submitting. Um, so the first question that came through is, what do you think about always starting a meeting with a today's agenda slide? I do, traditionally, I do think that helps. I think sending the agenda ahead of time is a big help to get people's um, brains prepared for what's coming and the time, the time allotment. So I do think, so I break my own rules to make my own rules too. So agendas usually help quite a bit. And um, it's a good way to weed through and figure out and take a step back when you're creating the agenda of what's needed and what's not. Maybe there's some things to that can be pre-worked on uh, ahead of the meeting. So you're using that time together to work on stuff that you can't duplicate in a offline conversation. Great, thank you. Um, so another question um, that was submitted prior to the event, uh, sometimes people wanna hold Zoom meetings uh, when it can really be accomplished over an email or phone call. Um, how do we change that office culture to minimize the amount of Zoom meetings? Well, I think I started to touch on that is really taking a step back and asking ourselves basically, what's important and what do I get from having that conversation um, in person. Now, harking back to HR days, if I found it helped me more to have a face-to-face -face conversation where I was looking at somebody's reactions and body angles and the nuances, then Zoom would be a big help. If it's a conversation with a one, or one colleague, one-to-one, -one, where I already know what they look like and we have a, a reasonable rapport, and comfort in their style, I think a phone would work. It gives us a chance to maybe sit someplace and not worry about all the, the optics of what's going on behind the scenes and some flexibility. So I think it's asking, what am I looking, not just what my intention is, but what I want this experience to be like. Great. Um, and then a question just came through, um, what is the rule about beginning and ending a meeting, a Zoom meeting specifically on time, especially when folks are gathering from around the world in various time zones? Um, well, Andrea did a good example of this today. She alerted people about 
managing expectations when we were getting our tech um, situation ready and also establishing time. And time means so much different things for people, but what a real start time is. I always build a few minutes. Uh, I do a lot of Zoom meetings and Zoom conference calls with uh, the association clients and usually build in a few minutes for disruption, for uh, connectivity. And that's usually a good time to do some just casual chit chat. But I think forming the habit and being consistent of what uh, a good meeting behavior looks like will help take the stress out. Uh, it doesn't matter Zoom, it happens in person when there was always that one person who decided to roll in 10 minutes late. And so it's up to the group to, to guide them in saying, um, everyone is important in the meeting and uh, we need to respect people's times because it does create a lot of stress. I also think building a cushion before and after is a, is a, a notable thing um, to do. So you're not just panting and worrying about the next meeting. Because what happens if you're scheduled, your, your brain is turned off by the last five, 10 minutes. You've totally discounted most of the conversations because you're worried about um, creating an effect that you're showing up late at the next meeting. Good question. Great. Um, and in terms of um, icebreakers in a Zoom meeting space, uh, do you have any suggestions to kind of um, break the ice um, in a Zoom meeting? I think um, giving that opportunity to other people in, in the room can be great. It shouldn't just be the person who's the manager supervising. Like delegating different roles in the group also keeps the energy uh, in the room. So I'm not avoiding your question, but I'm thinking about ice cream, keeping it neutral, keeping it inclusive. Um, food is usually a good thing, what people ate, um, some hobbies if you know about. So if you know about it ahead of time to check in with people, or if there's something that uh, an individual is very proud of, They've, they've done that week or something that they did that they wouldn't be able to do if, um, if they weren't in this environment, that could be a good sharing. Uh, but, you know, keep it approachable that everybody in the group, uh, no matter what their level in the organization or the group can participate in. So my example is I've worked in organizations where a lot of people play golf. Well, golf wouldn't have been the icebreaker comment for the whole group. That was more of a, um, special group of folks, you know, at the senior level. So figure out what people have in common or enjoy, or, you know, can be sports sometimes. That's usually a great icebreaker in some cases. Awesome. <laughs> Absolutely. So um, I guess another question is, um, are you a fan of breakout groups and how would you create those in terms of numbers and, and that sort of thing? I do like Zoom breakout groups. I do think they serve the purpose of building rapport and also giving people to have quiet conversations. I've been in a number of them this year uh, where I attended an international conference where we had breakout groups so people could share some personal stories or, or workshop some ideas. And it was great. I, I got to meet people that I wouldn't have spoken to and um, got to hear my own voice and practice things. So I do think they're, they're a great value. They're a great part for reflection. And I find that if you can use them to affect, sometimes not have the same breakout group every meet, you start to really have an opportunity to cross-pollinate within in the, uh, the organization. Uh, but practice before you do your breakout group so you're not having your staff or team floating out in the spider space. <laughs> so just tech, tech check everything. And I want to go back to the safe space. One thing about Zoom is preparing people for what and how are you going to use Zoom. Like the fact we're recording this experience and not everything needs to be recorded. So letting your participants know what that is. And then um, I had to take a, a humorous stab at safe space. For a long time, my husband was teaching from home for the first time in the first few months. And I was trying to keep a safe and sane space because the man does not have an indoor voice. He has been teaching, he has been coaching for years. He has one volume, which is loud. So there was a lot of negotiation and which is, put those in quotes, that word of 
figuring out what our work styles is and what it means um, when doors are closed or open, et cetera. So figure out what works for you. And um, uh, there's been a lot of juggling going on behind the scenes. I Many clients and friends have small children that are in virtual classrooms and elder care. So it's a lot, um, and like I said, figuring it out as we go. So fair play to everybody who's been doing this. Absolutely. Um, and the feeling of Groundhog Day uh, seems to be a real thing. Um, how do you stay motivated and excited to participate in Zoom meetings when you're kind of reliving the same day over and over again? Yes, remembering what day um, you did things or putting in scope. So that's why I chose to use humorous slides for visuals. So thinking about that little kid in the pink sweatshirt saying, how do I recreate that experience? Having a sense of humor and, and owning up. I think I've heard more confessions. I, I, like name a call or a Zoom meeting that doesn't start with, can you hear me? Or is, can you hear see me? Is the sound okay? Um, and just letting people know that I, you know, use your calendar for sure and just put in your pad, but like just own up, own up and be real. And I'm like, I think we have to kind of drop that illusion that we're in a, in a stage production. And so just be patient with yourself and be kind. Just take it one step at a time because we don't know. You can have the most sophisticated organization doing a Zoom and things happen. Uh, one colleague was doing a big conference and she had to, one staff had to volunteer to drive to the office, um, which was empty and safe to help manage slides. So I think your reaction times and ability to think on your feet or on your keyboard is going to be key and smile. Forgive yourself and have a laugh and write it down your diary of like, oh, here's another insane thing I did today because of this whole process. <laughs> Absolutely. And uh, one more question before we wrap up. Um, how would you suggest creating Zoom meeting norms for both existing and new meetings? Um, and then based on the number of folks in the Zoom call, whether it's like a small group or a larger group. That you know, harkens back to some of the slides because a lot of us work in different time zones. Like I have one meeting I set up where somebody's in Russia, somebody's in South Africa, somebody's in Alaska. So we've, we've settled on high noon uh, Eastern Standard Time for most of the calls because there's a reasonable chance somebody in that group is awake still and, and mildly functional. So I think you have to figure out what works best. So people, I think the biggest step forward is being honest about what you think will work best. Um, especially with folks who are working from home and having children that are, are taking school classes or virtual. This is the time for us to really change some of the norms and how we approach things and take a consensus. And then maybe you assign somebody to be your uh, stand-in if you have the luxury of another person in the group that you trust that are gonna um, help. And maybe that's the time you do record the Zoom because as much as people take notes, and not everybody remembers the context and the thing. So that might be something you, you run by people. Are you comfortable on us recording the call? So we have uh, something to refer to and remind us what we said and why we said it. So make mistakes and learn and then teach others and share, I think is the thing. Well, thank you so much, Julianne. Um, we appreciate you taking the time to share your expertise with us today. Uh, TC will be planning more digital events in the near future. So please stay tuned to emails from TC Alumni Relations and our social media channels. Uh, you will be receiving a link to this video presentation in a follow-up email. And we hope you can join us for the next event, Tell Me About Yourself, Storytelling and Job Interviews with TC Alumna Nancy Goldman on Tuesday, October 6th at 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Thank you all for joining us and we hope you have a wonderful afternoon.